As you know, uh, I've been praising South Dakota every time I've stood up this week, and uh, I have to do it once more in front of the governor. <laughs> Among the things to admire is its speed laws. <laughs> And if you uh, ride motorcycles sometimes, then you'll really love them. Um, also, I, I've got nowhere. I've been negotiating with South Dakotans all day about my offer to trade governors <laughs> and, and, uh, and my offer to include six state senators. And the way the negotiations are going, they want me to take six state senators. <laughs> so, you know, I would do that. And uh, so I put the point to the governor, and she's thinking about it. <laughs> so it's a, a remarkable woman. Um, she's uh, negotiated her way through this mess brilliantly, better than anybody. Uh, I'd like to say she's the best man in politics since Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and uh I, I've been reading her speeches, and there's a big reason why she's been able to negotiate through this. She understands something. She understands the difference between common sense and expertise. And that was a great subject, theme subject of Winston Churchill, and almost nobody understands that today. Expert, expert knowledge is narrow knowledge, and you can't make decisions on it by itself ever. Uh, her career is spectacular. Uh, she grew up on a rancher family. Her father was killed in an accident on the ranch when he was 42, she told me. She basically took over all that when she was 22. She got a big tax bill immediately. She had to restructure her business and start some more businesses and pay off that tax bill. And, you know, it made her mad at the government and, uh, and mad at the tax system. And so then she gets selected to the State House and then the Congress and now governor. And I can't see that she's ever lost a race. Uh, and uh, I, I've just been encouraging her to have many more. She's probably the best governor in America, Christy Nome. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you. Welcome to South Dakota. We are so thrilled that you're here and that your meetings have gone well and that you get a chance to enjoy a little freedom. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think to understand the decisions that I've made, uh, you need to understand me a little bit, my background. So that's what we were discussing a little bit at my table, my background, how I was raised, and really the challenges, but also the moments of teaching. And one of the things I'll tell you before I give you my words for today, and I want to talk a little bit about freedom. I think the actual topic that I've been given is political issues and controversies is your theme, and they wanted me to specifically talk about liberty and the pandemic, so I will do that. But I also want you to understand that in the last six months, um, it has amazed me to watch fear control people. Um, that, that this pandemic really used emotion and fear to manipulate people in ways that we've never seen before. And what bothered me early on was recognizing the fact that when you have a leader overstep their authority in a time of crisis, that that's when you lose your country. So we were talking at our table a little bit about why I've spoken about the things that I've spoken about, why I've chosen to use my press conferences, as educational opportunities, it was because it was necessary. Um, it, was, it, it became very real to me that I was making different decisions than virtually any other governor in the nation and that people didn't know why. And that a little bit of our history, constitution, the reason that America is special needed to be revisited again. And that really is uh, behind a lot of the decisions that we've had here in South Dakota. So you are in a special place because as you travel from state to state, you'll see a lot of challenges. When you come to South Dakota, you realize that our people are happy. 
that they wake up happy in the morning and they're optimistic about the future. So for those of you who aren't from South Dakota and you don't know me, I've gotten a lot of attention recently from the mainstream media. Uh, what I tend to say to individuals is six months ago, you probably had no idea who I was. The reason that you know who I am is because the mainstream media told the world that I was the only governor in America that was making all the wrong decisions um, on how I handled the pandemic. In fact, specifically Rachel Maddow, Elizabeth Warren, the New York Times, the Washington Post, you name it, I was the focus of every single one of their stories. But this week, a very prominent national reporter wrote me a note and said, Governor, uh, if you hadn't stood against the lockdowns, we would have had no proof as to how useless they really have been. So at the start of 2020, I outlined to all the people in the state about uh, how we are unique. I encouraged people from across the country to come to South Dakota and the opportunities that we provided. I talked about our people, about their work ethic, their values. I talked about our government, how it was limited. We had a low tax and regulatory structure. And I also talked about our way of life, what made South Dakota special one that respects uh, our, and cherishes the principles of thrift, hard work, family, and self-governance. South Dakota was second to none. And then a global pandemic hit. So rightly so, all of our attention shifted from telling the country that South Dakota is open for business to making sure that South Dakotans had the best information available to them to respond to the virus. Now, this virus posed many challenges for us. Uh, and the situation has been historic in the absolute worst way. But with every challenge comes an opportunity to learn, to adapt, and to improve. So let's take a couple of minutes to walk through some of the lessons that we have learned. And per perhaps the most significant one of those lessons, is, lessons that we've learned is that more freedom and not more government is the answer. Now, while freedom isn't uh, necessarily the one thing that will solve all of our problems, it will certainly take us down the road much farther towards where we want to go. Freedom is a much better friend to true science uh, than government-centered or government-controlled science. Freedom, not government, is the best friend of innovation. Freedom focuses on politics of persuasion and the intellectual strength of all of our positions, not on control, coercion, and the heavy hand of government. And if someone is interested in the common good in all of its iterations and complexities, freedom is the one and the only choice available to us. Now, my approach to this virus um, was to provide South Dakotans with all of the information that I had available to me and to then allow them to exercise their freedom to make the best decisions for themselves and for their families. We took a unique path. We did not uh, lock people up. We did not close any businesses in the state of South Dakota. Not once did we issue a shelter in place. Uh, I didn't even define what an essential business was because I don't believe that I have the authority to tell you your business is an essential. <laughs> In return, the mainstream media spent countless hours and endless column inches in their papers attacking me for it. And frankly, that's the only reason that I'm in the national spotlight today, is because liberals, as I told Dr. Arn here, is that have literally been kicking me in the head every night on national TV for the decisions that I made for South Dakota. Rachel Maddow, Elizabeth Warren have relentlessly attacked me night after night for the decisions that I've made. Now, while the Washington elites and the mainstream media hurled their relentless criticism, the vast majority of South Dakotans have thanked me. They've thanked me for the opportunity to be trusted. Um, beyond that, many of my peers, though, applied a one-size-fits-all lockdown. Um, other ordinary Americans, though, the lifeblood of the nation were watching what we were doing here in South Dakota. They saw the different actions that we were taking. And many said that's exactly the way 
that I want my government to treat me. I want my government to trust me, not dictate to me. This leaves me to wonder, what does this say, what does this say about the state of our media today? When they hold up elected officials who they believe are making the wrong decisions and they attack them and go after them personally and politically, but yet other officials that are elected into office are praised because they fall into a line with the agenda that they have. And they're shielded from real scrutiny of the results of their actions. And this also brings me to the topic of modeling. Now, while modeling certainly has a place, models have two shortcomings today. Uh, and really, no model can actually predict the future, and especially when those models are based on incomplete information, which we saw widespread throughout the last several months. And no model can actually replace human freedom as the best path to responding to our life's risks, including in response to this virus. That is why central planning of the economy, including, uh, has failed us every single time the government has tried it. Now, in South Dakota, we used modeling as a tool. We used it to prepare for the worst case scenario should that come. Thankfully, it never did. It still could in the future, and we are prepared for that but we have not seen it yet today. But there's no model that can take into consideration all of the factors that make real life work. A blind reliance on insufficient modeling has led some politicians to institute disastrous lockdowns that have only jeopardized people's health and their welfare, but also created conditions for a financial catastrophe that will cause untold burdens on costs of their people for generations to come. The financial burden of government lockdowns made one thing, one thing clear, that urban life isn't all that it's cracked up to be. <laughs> In South Dakota, the rural way of life is the preferred way of life. Folks who want to stay on their land pass it on to their kids and their grandkids. They also want to be in their communities that they've called home for generations, and they want to eat in small mom and pop restaurants, visit some of the world's most beautiful places, and have their kids spend more time with their tackle box rather than an Xbox. And sure, big famous cities like New York City are home to some iconic buildings and some beautiful museums, but they also come with traffic, with noise, congestion, and in a post-COVID world, they're gonna come with sanitary issues as well. As we've seen throughout the pandemic, population density does come with a steep cost. So some think that COVID-19 will accelerate a move of people out of the cities, that it will uh, move people to rural areas because of that preferred way of life, but that story is still being written. One of the few things we know about this virus is that density is one of the key factors contributing to the spread. But because of that, New York City and Silicon Valley could look very different in the future. But the lessons of this virus do not stop at city limits. While many can work uh, remotely from their laptops indefinitely, a key takeaway from COVID that I've learned and that I hope all of you learn is that America's workers, the farmers, the truckers, the ranchers, plumbers, grocers, healthcare workers, the builders in the, and the producers of this country are more critical than ever. That the fundamentals of life haven't changed. That people still need the basic necessities of life that grocery stores still need to be stocked, lights need to stay on, and doctors need to keep seeing patients. So for those of you who are the builders and the producers and the essential workers of today and you are scattered throughout the country, if you've seen how South Dakota has managed this pandemic and you like it, we'd like you to move to South Dakota. <laughs> To those of you who are professionals, who are working from home permanently, if you value our way of life where people love freedom, smaller communities, lots of wide open spaces, I'd like you to really consider making your workplace, your workspace right here in South Dakota as well. And for those of you who own businesses in other states, who are frustrated that your business was forced to close, that you saw one leader's decision completely take away your life savings and your way of life, I will remind you, we have the friendliest tax environment in the entire country, the lowest regulatory burden, and we will not close your business for you. 
We trust our business owners to be flexible. We gave them the opportunity to be innovative, and we allowed them to take care of their customers and their employees and put food on the table. We would absolutely love for you to move your business to South Dakota. Now, not all governors in this country trusted their people like I did. Different paths uh, mean that sometimes people have different choices, but in South Dakota, like it always does, we choose common sense. If you want freedom, personal responsibility, and a government that works for you rather than dictates to you, South Dakota is the place to get it. Our trips to the store might look a little bit different today, and our sporting events might change, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's an opportunity for us to do better, to be innovative, to create new ways of serving each other. But I want to leave you with this thought. No one saw 2020 playing out the way that it has. Each and every one of us has dramatically changed our day-to-day -day lives. Um, we had to adjust to be adaptable. And to all those who have lost loved ones throughout this pandemic, my heart breaks for each and every one of you. Things will not be the same in the future, but today we do have a very different opportunity than we had in the past. Don't ever forget this one fundamental truth. The windshield is much bigger than the rear view mirror for, for a reason. There's a purpose to it. In South Dakota, we always look at adversary or adversity. We always look at challenges as an opportunity to do better. We focus on our future, what's in front of us, and it's bright. Hope is in front of us. We are emerging from this stronger than ever, and we are concerned what the future may hold for you if you don't join us. We would love to have you in our state, and that wherever you are, that if you choose to come to South Dakota, just remember this, that the air is fresh, the people are free, and the possibilities here are endless. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to be with you. So I understand we're going to take a few questions. Thank you, Governor Nome. Yes. Uh, we now have time for some Q&A. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be brought to you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, with your approach to the pandemic, uh, how have your hospitals uh, uh, survived with, the, um, uh, with their uh, capacities? Yeah, they've done a fantastic job. We have three major health care systems in the state of South Dakota, and we immediately brought them in back in January. That was when we first started hearing about the virus in other countries, and I opened up an emergency operations center and started working and studying what was happening in those countries, what we could learn about the virus before it got to the United States, and then as it came to the United States, what was happening in other states to learn. So we brought them in at the ground level, and helped us with planning and implementation and responding to people's needs, and they're doing great. So Dr. Fauci told me on my worst day, I'd have 10,000 people in the hospital from COVID-19. I think my worst day so far, I've had a little over 200. So that's one of the things that we did uh, is even through no mandates, uh, we encouraged people that if they were of the vulnerable population to stay home, that if they were going to be older, they had health conditions that could put them in the hospital, that we wanted them to take extra precautions, told them that we would serve them and help them get groceries and do those kind of things that gave people the recommendations on social distancing, all of that. But I also said, in South Dakota, we're not going to focus on positive cases of the virus. We know we can't stop this virus. The science tells us that. All we can do is slow it down so that we have the capacity to take care of people in our health care systems. What I talked about every single day and still talk about today is how many people do we have in the hospital? That was our main focus, was that we made sure we had the experts ready to respond at a time of need. So today I have about 9% of folks in my hospital systems are there because of COVID-19. I think in my ICUs, 12% of the people that are there are there from COVID-19. So we're in great shape as it comes to having that capacity available for those folks that would catch the virus and need that care. 
Have any other governors called you, and have you given them advice, and what reaction did they have? Well, that's, that's kind of the behind the scenes that people don't really know, is that we spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on the phone talking as governors. Um, you know, there's several different national organizations that facilitated calls, but then there's many of us that had individual calls, and then groups of eight or ten of us would all get on calls and talk at night as well. So um, what I will tell you is that every piece of information that I had available to me, they had available to them as well. I consulted with all of my health experts. I consulted with my state epidemiologist, my secretary of health, uh, and listened and studied the models. One of the things I think I did that no other governors did was I also sat on quite a few conference calls of nationwide secretaries of health and listened to them. Many of those calls I was the only governor on. Uh, the state epidemiologists from every state would have weekly conference calls that I would sit on and just listen. I didn't want to rely on somebody else to to relay to me what was said on those calls I wanted to learn for myself, but I also consulted with my general counsel. I also consulted with attorneys who specifically focus on constitutional authority. And I wanted to know what authority did I have that the U.S. Constitution gives me because I have the, I have, uh, I've taken the oath to uphold that Constitution and I wanted to know what the Constitution of the state of South Dakota told me my authority was and what it wasn't. Um, so I came at it from that viewpoint of really what my role was as governor and what my role wasn't. And I had all those debates and discussions with all those governors before they made their decisions to institute lockdowns and mandates. And, and those were conversations that we did have. They just made a different choice. But I, one, one of the honest conversations, too, that I, I mean, it wouldn't be unfair for me to say that every if I did not point out that every governor has a different situation. But I do know that in listening to them talk, I heard the fear in their voices. They were dealing with a, a health crisis, and the, often the response I would get would be, Christy, but if I do that, people might die. And that that was what they really wrestled with. So I think the reality of it, being in leadership at this point in time, was a very lonely place to be. You know, we all have incredible teams around us that give us advice and give us wisdom. But ultimately, when the final decision had to be made, it was that governor that had to make that decision. For me, it was, okay, governor, now you need to decide, and I had to make it. So that really was the challenge I think governors faced. And while they had the information, they knew their authorities, some of them made very different decisions. And I think for their people, it's extremely unfortunate. We have a question on the speaker's right. Sure. Uh, I'm a crusty old veteran. And on behalf of my network of crusty old veterans, we want to thank you. You are the governor who most embodies the freedom we all entered military service to defend. Oh. Besides that, um, a lot of my veteran friends are constantly talking and asking, what can we do as ordinary people to advance freedom in this world where we get shut down on social media, where we get yelled at if we bring up a point that's not the normal narrative, and we just feel helpless a lot of the time and, and love to hear what you think we can do. Okay, can I just tell you how remarkable this is right now? We have somebody who served in our military, went and risked their lives to defend our freedom, asking what more they can do to defend our freedom. So, so that's what is incredible about our country. And we should be able to turn on our nightly news and see stuff like that rather than the garbage we have to watch every single night. But thank you for serving our country and, and for doing that due diligence to make sure that we are intact and we're the special country that we are today. What I would say is that we need you to be normal people and to go out and have conversations that you're not having today. Um, I'll get real candid here for a minute, but when you go fill your car with gas, are you asking the person at the pump next to you who they're voting for and why? And having that conversation, when you go to church, are you talking to people about how important it is that America's fundamental freedoms are protected? And, you know, that's, we all have these conversations in our groups and we, but there's people that we just avoid that conversation with. And we also need to remember not to do it in an aggressive, mean manner. Um, you know, we, people will be attracted to us by our optimism, by our hope. I honestly feel like 
and I'm a Republican and I'm proud to be a Republican, that all we did here in South Dakota was we implemented the Republican platform that we say we believe. Uh, um, other people stand up as Republicans and say they believe it, but they never do it. We actually did it. And so what we've seen now is incredible benefits to people that now we can point to as it actually works. But I also know that for many people, we are paying the consequences for how we speak to each other. How we talk to each other has consequences, and we have dehumanized each other throughout that process. So we need to remind each other that we are people and have a heart connection with them, and when we're talking to them, really listen and, and, and tell your stories. I think your stories would be most impactful, how you decided to go into the military, how you decided to protect this country and why it was important, and then use every opportunity to teach people. Because that's what I realized throughout this pandemic was nobody really knows or reflects on our history and what it brings to us. This tearing down of our monuments breaks my heart. It is our history, and these people were not perfect. I'm not perfect. Who of you out here has lived up to your own ideals? We have flawed leaders that helped our country get through challenging times and did incredible things for us. We didn't say they were perfect, but we can learn from them. And they're a part of our history, and that's one of the things that I think people are not reflecting on today. So um, just don't lose sight of the value of individuals and their willingness to have a conversation. And remember to be happy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I believe that people are attracted to us because they want more of what we have. And if you give the persona that it's all negativity and ugliness and condemning and judgmental, um, that doesn't really attract people to the right viewpoint of what's special about America. Last, last thing I'll say on this point is, and I'm sure my staff is tired of hearing me say this, Ian's laughing. You know, we all love to be offended. Oh, this country's addicted to being offended, aren't they? I mean, I, they really are. We, we turn on the news and somebody says something, oh, it's so offensive that they said that and we can't believe it and it's just unbelievable and we just really need to get over ourselves. You know, it, we really do. I had a pastor tell me one time, he said, Christy, people are gonna throw out offenses all the time. You're the one who decides if you wanna pick them up and carry them around. He says, then you're the one carrying the burden. So who's losing in that situation? I think that's true. People are going to offend us all the time. And we need to just decide we're going to let it lay, walk by it, and just go on and be happy and understand that what we have is special. Uh, Governor, I'm here from Minnesota. And I just want to say I'm enjoying breathing the free air of yes, South Dakota. I bet you are. Um, Last spring, I'm not sure exactly when, I had heard you interviewed on Hannity, I believe, um, talking about hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. and some studies that you were going to mm -hmm. do. And of course, any positive news about that it would never receive the light of day. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit, was that something that you brought to fruition and what, if anything, came of that? Yes, we in South Dakota did the first ever statewide, state-backed partnership with our all of our health care systems on a trial on hydroxychloroquine. Um, that's never happened before in the country, but where the state government partnered with our three major healthcare sy sy systems to open it up to every single person if the state, if they wanted to participate. It was remarkable. We have several, Sanford Health is our healthcare system in the state um, that has the research arm to it and is doing several different trials um, on therapeutics, but also vaccines, and has been very helpful throughout the pandemic to get the facts and information out. We have time for one more question. Sure. Hi, I certainly appreciate the fact that you're here, Christy. Uh, I married a South Dakota gal back in 1951, and I have a lot, a lot of in-laws and outlaws back in the Sioux Falls area. You do. So. <laughs> I but seriously, yeah, I've lived in, my, uh, in, in Montana now, but in uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan, and I'm sick to have to admit that the governors of those places fouled up so badly. You had one incredible instance at the old Moreau plant in Sioux Falls. Uh -huh. uh, Smithfield, I guess, owns it up. How did you have, it was a big hot spot and everything. How did you happen to handle that so quickly and it uh, disappeared as, as a mm -hmm. uh, negative thing for you? 
Well, you know, and we've seen these in different parts of the country, but we had a, a group of positive cases come out of a meat processing facility, and we went in there and addressed it, worked with the company, brought our healthcare officials in to do testing, to get people the information that they needed. And uh, many of these families that worked there were living in close quarters, working in close quarters, and so it was natural that it would spread. But I think what was important was that we didn't overreact. We took care of people. And, and that was important, we got it under control. And I told people from the very beginning that we're gonna see cases go up, cases go down. People, we're gonna have different counties, different communities that are going to have an increase in cases and then go back down. Um, I said, there may be days that I stand in front of you and I say, we have thousands of new cases. I've never had to do that yet. But I said, I prepared people for the fact that if that were to happen, that would be expected. And so calming people down and letting them know what was in the future and being truthful, I think, was incredibly helpful. But by not getting um, distracted or pressured by media and people who had an agenda beyond taking care of people, I think, was incredibly important. My Secretary of Health said to me one day before the pandemic even started in South Dakota, she said, Governor, I just want to tell my team, uh, do you want to make decisions that make people feel good or do you want to do good? And I said, we will always do good. So we took the emotion out of our decision making right away so that we could focus on the facts and the science and the data of what was happening here in our state and use that to make sure that we were implementing things that actually worked. Please join me in thanking Governor Noem. Thank you, everybody.